you, they all agree together. It seems like they're all on the same page, but they won't love you because you're not a part of them. You're not a part of them. He said, but understand this, they hated me first before they hated you, so they'll hate you without a cause as well. And so we learn from him. And then we, chapter 16, we receive from him. He talked about sending the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit, it's another, he's another comforter. He happens to be a member of the Godhead. We talk about God the Father and God the Son all the time. When was the last time you heard a message on God the Holy Spirit? We talked about that a couple weeks ago, that we need to receive from Him. He's giving the Holy Spirit. When He leaves, He said, it's going to be very fruitful and profitable for you, because when I go away, He will come, the Holy Spirit of God. And when He comes, He has a ministry, just like I had a ministry. He has a ministry, and here's His ministry. He's going to bring comfort to believers. He's going to comfort believers. When you go through difficult times, he'll be the one that, that comforts you. Not only will he comfort believers, he will bring conviction to the world. He said he will convict the world of sin. Now, that, that's good to know that the Holy Spirit is doing that for us because when we go out and witness to our friends who are without Jesus Christ, it's not a matter of you trying to bring conviction. It's a matter of just telling them the truth, what God has his plan and purpose for their life. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction. And he'll bring conviction of sin because they don't believe on Jesus you say, do they have to believe on Jesus, friend? Listen, the biggest lie in the world is there's many ways to heaven. Jesus cleared that up. He said, there, here, here it is. There's only one way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. We saw that in John, John 14. If you want to go to heaven, it has to be Jesus. But in John 16, the Holy Spirit will convict people of sin because they don't believe on Jesus. They have to believe on Jesus. And by the way, it's not just believing about Jesus. It's believing who he is. C.S. Lewis, who was uh, an agnostic until, uh, is it Tolkien, the guy, Lord of the Rings? Uh, he was the one that led C.S. Lewis to the Lord, who ended up writing some phenomenal books. He wrote a book called Mere Christianity. He said that the world wants to look at Jesus, and they'll say he's a good teacher, he's a good, he's a good man, he's a benevolent man, he's, a, he's a, a great speaker. But C.S. Lewis said, those aren't the options on the table. The options on the, ta on the table are this, is he who he claimed to be? And he claimed to be God. So Jesus is either one of three things. He called it the trilemma. He's either a lunatic, he's, he's uh, uh, a lunatic, he's uh, the devil, or he's Lord. He's either, he's either the Lord or he's not. And so C.S. Lewis laid those on the table. Those are the options that are out there. He's either a lunatic, a liar, or he's the Lord. And friends, Jesus Christ is Lord, and the Holy Spirit will convict people of that, that there's only one way to heaven, it's through Jesus Christ. Not only will he convict them of sin because they don't believe on Jesus, he'll, he'll, he will convict them of righteousness because he says, I go to my Father and you see me no more. Jesus was talking about not only the resurrection but the ascension. And so he says he will convict them of that. And not only that, he will convict them of judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world has already been judged. In essence, if God didn't spare Satan, who was a created angel, he will not spare those who reject the claims of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit's role is to convict people and bring them to Jesus Christ. We saw that. Last week, we looked at examine with Jesus, how we need to examine our own selves. We took the Lord's Supper here a few weeks ago and just kind of looked at what, what, where we're at in the faith. And when you look at examining your own self, we saw that uh, uh, you can be a part of the group and not be a part of the family. You see, that was what Judas was. Think about it. Judas was a part of the group. Matter of fact, he was the keeper of the bag. He was the treasurer. You don't just put anybody to be the treasurer. You put the most trusted person. And to them, it was all about Judas. Matter of fact, Judas was the only one that was from Jerusalem. The rest of them were from up north, from Galilee, right? And so when it came time to pick the, the right person, they said, he, he fits the description. He's the most, you know, trusted. He's who we want. And they made Judas their treasurer. And we learned a lesson last week that you can be a part of the group and not be a part of the family. Judas was a part of the group. He just never was a part of the family. Peter, we learned something about Peter as well. We saw that Peter thought it was what he could do for Jesus that mattered. Remember he told Jesus he would never deny him. And I really believe he meant that with all his heart. So much so that in the garden when they tried to arrest Jesus, what did, what did, what did Peter do? I mean, he took a sword. Is he a warrior? No, no. Peter's a fisherman, Right? <laughs> He's a fisherman. What's he doing with the sword? Because he promised he would be there by Jesus. He would die for him. And he goes after this, this other soldier, and he takes a swing at him, and he cuts his ear off. He said, that's pretty good marksmanship right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't think he was going for his ear. 
I think he just a lousy swordsman. I think he was going for his head. And remember what Jesus said? He stopped, said, Peter, put, put the sword away. We're not going to do it that way. He takes the man's ear, and he puts it right back on him, right? He puts it right back on him. He heals him. I wonder if Jesus said, can you hear me now? <laughs> Later on, that would come up when Peter was around the fire, keeping uh, warm that the, you, you cut my cousin's ear off, and they, they, they point an accusation at him. And, and Peter denied the Lord just like Jesus said he would. But before we point our finger at Judas and at Peter, I think we all got to examine our own lives. It's like the old song said, it's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Where are you at in your Christian walk in faith? It's not a matter of what you can do for Jesus. It's a matter of understanding what Jesus has done for you. That makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. And so today what we want to do is we want, we want to look at him. Why, why, would they, why would they hate him? Why would they put him on a cross to suffer and die? And we're going to get the answer here in John chapter 18 and 19. Look at him. Look at him. In John chapter 18, I want you to notice what it says in verse 12. It says, Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. First of all, I want to talk about what the priest said. When he looked at Jesus, here's what he said about Jesus. What the priest said. And in here you see, and I want you to kind of put a star. I don't know if you write in your Bible, but put a little asterisk by verse 14. We're going to come back to that. I want you to hold that thought. That thought that Caiaphas said he doesn't realize is going to fulfill Scripture. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. But I want you to remember that thought. He says, it, it, he says it is expedient that one man should die for the people. So we see uh, what the priest said to the people. What the priest said to the people. Not only did he think it was... Uh, expedient that one man should die, but you know what they accused Jesus of when they took him before uh, um, Herod and before Pilate and uh, before the council? Before they did that, they would have to get together, and what were we going to lay charges about against him? Well, first of all, they called him a blasphemer. They called him a blas... That's about the worst you could call somebody in the Jewish faith. He is a blasphemer. Well, when, when did Jesus blaspheme? Well, you go back to John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, I am. When he said that, they knew what he was saying. He was claiming to be God. In the Old Testament, Moses went before a burning bush, and a burning bush was calling him and saying, go to Egypt, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, Who, what's your name? Who shall I say sent me? And the bush said, I am that I am. You say I am has sent me. So here, Jesus stands up and says, before Abraham was, I am, uh, they, they recognize that he's blaspheming. He claims to be God. He did it again in John chapter 10. He said, I and the Father are one. And as soon as they said, he said that, they picked up stones to stone him. And he said, well, for what good work have I done? You're going to stone me. He said, they said, not because of your works, but because of your words. You claim to be God. And yeah, he did. He did. And in here they accused him of blasphemy. Not only did they accuse him of being a blasphemer, they accused him of being a criminal. They accused him of being a criminal. Look what it says in verse 29. It says, Then Pilate went to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, someone who did evil, we would not have delivered him to you. So what were Jesus' crimes? What did he do? When you study about Jesus and look at the Gospels, uh, he healed a lot of people, didn't he? he? Healed a lot of people. Healed the, the lame. He healed the leper. He took the blind man, gave him vision. Matter of fact, he even raised people from the dead. How about that? that? That's pretty evil, isn't it? Not only did he heal people, he fed people. On one occasion, there were 5,000 people, it said. Just men alone, not including wives and children. 5,000 people. Then in another case, he feeds 4,000 people. He took care. He was benevolent. He wanted to make sure that they were fed before they went home. Not only did he feed people, he loved people. He loved people more than anything in this world. He was always there to meet needs. When we talk about healing, and one of my professors said one time, he said that it's pretty much estimated and guesstimated that Jesus healed just about everybody in that region. Everybody. Because when they heard about him, they came from miles around. Not only did that, he forgave people. That's another reason why they called him a blasphemer. When he forgave the man's sins, they thought to themselves, only God can do this. 
and the right. Only God can do that. And that's why Jesus Christ came. He came upon a divine seek and save rescue mission is what he did. And they called him not only a blasphemer, they said he is a criminal worthy of death. Well, we see what the priest said to the people. They all agreed it was a mob mentality. Let's see what he said to the politician. What did the priest say to the politician? Look what it says in chapter 18. Just turn back a little bit. Uh, or look, look at verse 40. To the politician, well, first of all, look what it says in verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release the king of the Jews? Talking about Jesus. Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but who? Barabbas. And then it gives us a footnote. Now, Barabbas was a robber. I like the old King James Version. He was a malefactor. He was the worst of the worst. He wasn't just a robber. He was the worst criminal that Rome could have. The only people that ever get executed on a cross are the worst of the worst. And Barabbas was in line for that. And so Pilate thought he would be, you know, slick and just bring Barabbas out there. And when, when they bring him out there, that, that maybe they would say, you know, hey, you know, uh, yeah, you know, release Jesus. No, they said release Barabbas. In essence, they said release the guilty. Look what it says in chapter 19, verse 15. It says, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Wow. What were they saying? Well, they said release the guilty, but crucify the innocent. Crucify the innocent. See, this has all fallen into place. This stuff has been planned in eternity past. Jesus recognized that for this hour is why he has come into the world, for this very hour right here. And we're seeing this thing unfold. It's kind of getting nasty and ugly. I mean, the religious crowd is out to get him. We see what he said to the people, and we see what the priest said to the politician. How about this? What, what, what the politician said. I think we'd all like to hear what the politician said. Amen? Can I get an amen? What do politicians say? Politicians say what you want to hear. That's what they say, right? Here's, how, how, do, how do they make decisions? Here's how they do it. You know, I'll, I'll be quite frank. Can, can I quit preaching and go to meddling? Give me, give me just a moment here. Um, you ever get a survey from your politician that says, uh, uh, on these issues, where do you stand? You know what? I, I, it doesn't matter where I stand. I want to know where you stand. That's why I voted for you. If I voted for you, it's because you stand on the principles. If you're going to change those based upon popular opinion, you're not getting my vote. Can I get an amen, amen on that? Let's, let's, let's vote for people of principle who will stand on what they say they will do. And it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy world out there in which we live today. There's no difference in politicians back then and back here today. Pilate wanted to hear what, uh, what the crowd thought. And so it's kind of interesting as he was talking to the crowd. Look at what it says, chapter 18. Um, look what it says in verse 39. It said, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they said, no, no, we want Barabbas Crucify Jesus. Crucify Jesus. Well, look what he says in verse 38. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Him and Jesus are having a dialogue back and forth. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him. Look what he says in chapter 19, verse 4. Pilate then went again unto them and said, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Twice. Third time, look at verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. No fault in him. Can he be any more clear? He found no fault in Jesus. All he saw was a bunch of trumped-up charges. Jesus claimed to be a, be a king, or he claimed to be God. And to them, that was trumped-up charges. So he said, I find no fault in him. Not only did he find no fault in him, he found no cause. Look what it says in verse 7 of chapter 19. Verse 7. It says, the Jews answered and said to him, we have a law concerning, uh, according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. And he went into the practorum and said to Jesus, where, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you? And power to release you? And what Jesus says next, I'm sure rattle him to his very core. 
Look what Jesus said in verse 11. Jesus answered and said, You have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Wow. Look at verse 12. Then, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. That answered Pilate's question. Not, not only do I find no fault in him, Pilate said, I find no cause to crucify him. So he took him out there and just handed him over to the Jews to do what they wanted to do. But the question is this, um, why would they have a mob mentality against him? When you look at everything he did, you know what it was? Jesus didn't fit what they thought their Messiah should look like. Even though the Old Testament prophesied all these prophecies and said this is what he would do, he would do this, 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 and they, they ignored it. And so they hated him without a cause. Matter of fact, it's interesting, when he started doing miracles and started preaching messages, it was at that point in Matthew 12 that it says that they sought and talk to themselves on how they might destroy him, how they might kill him, get rid of him. And so this was a plot that was going on for quite a while. Well, we see what the priest said, and we see what the politician said, but probably what's more important than anything else is what did the prophecy say? Say, what did the prophecy say? Yeah. Friend, let me say something. This is what sets this book apart from every other book that's out there. Prophecies. You can read the Koran. You can read the Pearl of Great Price. Uh, um, you can you read any religious book out there that you feel is Grimm's fairy tales, whatever inspires you. But this is what sets this book apart from all the other books. It's fulfilled prophecy. You're watching it right here in this passage in John 18 and 19. There's prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that is being fulfilled in this very chapter right here. And this is what sets the Bible apart from every other book. So what we want to do is not only do we want to see what the priest said and what the politician said, but what do the prophecies say? Why was Jesus crucified? Why was Jesus crucified? Well, let's talk about the prophecies about Jesus. The prophecies about Jesus. Look what it says in uh, chapter 18. Chapter 18, just turn back a page, verse 31. Look what it says in verse 31. Then, then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Now, wait a minute. They could put people to death. It's just Jesus wasn't going to die the kind of death they wanted him to die. They, they weren't going they, they to stone him to death. They wanted him to die the kind of death that the Romans offered. The worst of the worst as well. They wanted him to die a different way, not through a stoning. So look what it says in verse... Um, go to chapter 19. Just turn over a page. Look what it says in verse 16. This is the kind of death that Jesus would die. It says, Then he delivered him to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went to a place called Gol the place of the skull, which is called Golgotha, where they crucified him. Wow. You know what they wanted Jesus to die? They wanted him to die a crucifixion, a cross kind of death. You know what? All they're doing is fulfilling Scripture, not even realizing it. Think about it. You know, Jesus knew the kind of death he was going to die. Remember the guy in Nicodemus? You meet him in John chapter 3. He comes to Jesus by night. Why? Because he's a religious leader in the synagogue, and it would be detrimental if anybody saw him talking to Jesus because they are, the, the synagogue was talking about him. How they're going to get rid of him? We've got to get rid of this guy. He's a, he's a troublemaker. And, and so Nicodemus comes to him because there's something in Nicodemus' heart that he knows is just special about Jesus. It's interesting. Nicodemus is looking right at him eyeball to eyeball and says, We know that you've come from God. Here he is talking to God in the flesh, saying, we know you've come from God. Because nobody can do what you do except God be with him. And so Jesus cuts right to the chase, right? He knows Nicodemus' heart. What's he say? Nick, he stops him. Nick, you need to be born again. Three times. You need to be born again. You need to be born again. Nick needed salvation. He needed to be born again. And in that passage, Jesus makes a statement. It's a prophecy fulfilling his death. What is that prophecy? In John chapter 3, verse 14, he says this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow, you recognize that verse. Yeah, it's right there, right before John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He was fulfilling a prophecy. Jesus said that he would die being lifted up, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And so we see that Jesus would die being lifted up. He would die a cross kind of death. 
Not only that, he would be numbered with the criminals. Look what it says in verse 18. Where, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Do you know that that was a fulfillment of Scripture as well? That was a fulfillment of Scripture as well, that he would be crucified with the criminals, one on each side. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 12, and he was numbered with the transgressors. The transgressors are the worst of the worst. Who would have thought that the Messiah would die with the worst of the worst? Well, Isaiah prophesied that 700 years before Jesus even arrived on the scene. Not only would he die being lifted up, but he would be numbered with the criminals. He would be numbered with the criminals. It's interesting that verse in Isaiah 53 says that, uh, and he would be numbered with the transgressors. It goes on and says this, makes this statement, and he made intercession for the transgressors. I, I don't want you to miss this because when Jesus died on the cross and the, the transgressors, the, the malefactors, the robbers, the worst of the worst, they were blaspheming on Jesus as well. They were making fun of him, both of them. But it's kind of interesting as the, the, as the day went on and they're both saying things back and forth and one guy says, on, and Jesus says, say, you're the Messiah, right? He said, well then save yourself and, and save us too. Basically, if there's going to be an uprising, let's do this. Well, he wasn't doing it. Let's do this, right? He's got his hands there. If there's going to be an uprising, let's do this. And it's kind of interesting because all of a sudden, the other guy's been watching. He's been listening. And all he hears is Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Wow. This guy's asking for forgiveness. And I'm sure just about everybody in the crowd had heard about Jesus. They'd heard stories about Jesus. This guy was no different. Maybe he heard a sermon by Jesus and kind of laughed it off, a big joke, and saying, and here he is being crucified, and he's asking for forgiveness. And the one guy on the other side keeps railing on him. He keeps blaspheming him. And then finally the other guy goes, hey, shut up. Do you not fear God? It's like, wait a minute, what's this guy, what's, what's he doing? He didn't fear Rome, but this guy feared God. And remember what he said to Jesus? As Jesus was on the cross, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now don't miss this. When, when he made that statement, Lord, it's, it's kind of interesting. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 that nobody can call Jesus Lord except it be by the Spirit of God. Matthew, when they're arguing in chapter 22, going back and forth and, and, and dealing with um, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, it says all the disciples said, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And he came to Jesus, Judas and he said, Rabbi, is it I? See, Judas was a part of the group. He wasn't a part of the family. Jesus was not Lord of his life. But it's interesting, this thief on the cross, and what I'm gonna say right now may sound a little harsh, but, but I'll be just quite frank. If it weren't for the thief on the cross, I wouldn't believe in deathbed confessions. For people to live their whole life apart from Jesus Christ and never come to a saving faith, but because of the thief on the cross, you know what? I believe in deathbed confessions because of that. I believe it's never too late, never too late. Sad to say, I've talked to people that are on their deathbed and they thought, you know what? I didn't live for him and there's no way that Jesus is gonna accept me on my deathbed. See, Satan's still giving lies. I hear people say, well, if I... I've, I've lived the best years of my life. I have nothing to give God. Hey, how much did the thief on the cross offer Jesus? What could he do for Jesus? He wasn't going to Wednesday night prayer meeting that week, right? He wasn't going to Sunday school the next week. No, no, no. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then what did Jesus say? I love this. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Wow. That's what Isaiah 53 said. Isaiah 53 said he'd be crucified with the Lord. And by the way, and he would make intercessions for them as well. Father, got another one that's coming with me. Well, we see that he was numbered with the criminals and that fulfilled a prophecy. Matter of fact, they would gamble for his garments. Look at what it says in verse 23, chapter 19. It says in verse 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top, in one piece. And they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be? 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Little Vegas activity going there at the foot of the cross. Therefore the soldiers did these things, and they fulfilled the prophecy in Psalm 22, verse 18. Psalm 22, verse 18, they gambled for his garments. Let me say this. If you have a place to put a footnote, I'm going to ask you to kind of do a little homework this afternoon. You, you want to see some incredible prophecies. Let me give you a couple of things you need to read this afternoon. Some, just some chapters out of the Bible. I'm just kind of quoting from these back and forth. But you, you need to go to Psalm 22 and just read the whole chapter. That's the good shepherd chapter. chapter. Jesus is a good shepherd because the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Chapter 22 of Psalms starts off this way. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's how it starts off. Go ahead and read through that chapter. Read Isaiah 53. The whole chapter, Isaiah 53. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Read through that whole chapter. The incredible prophecies of the death of Jesus Christ from those chapters. We see that he would die being lifted up. He would be numbered with the criminals. They would gamble for his garments. Look what it says in verse 31. It says, therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who had seen had testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. They broke the one malefactor's legs, and they broke the other guy's. See, it was a way to hasten death. Part of the death is they would suffocate, right? And when they couldn't push themselves up on a cross anymore, they would just, they would die. And so they broke their legs, each one. But when they came to Jesus, they didn't. Jesus is already dead. Well, he said, who examined him? Well, a Roman centurion that had cross duty examined him. They had seen thousands of deaths. And when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. So what did he do? He pierced his side, pierced his side. Psalm 34, 20 says he guards all his bones and not a one of them is broken. It was fulfilling scripture. That's what he said. In here it also says, uh, notice what it says in verse uh, 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, uh, you go all the way down and it fulfills it. And notice what it says in verse 37. And again, another scripture says they shall look upon him whom they have, what? Pierced. They have pierced. By the way, Isaiah said that. So did Zechariah. Zechariah was 500 years before. Isaiah 700 years before. By the way, the Jews didn't pierce people back then. Again, they, they had rock concerts, right? They stoned them. Uh, so how would they pierce them? Well, you have a, a Roman government that that's their way of executing people. Not a bone in him would be broken, and they would look upon him whom they have pierced, which will fulfill those prophecies. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecies. That's what the prophecy said. But it still doesn't answer the question why. And that's what we want to get to right now. Why would they crucify him? What was the big deal about that? Well, Isaiah 53 tells us why they would crucify him. Isaiah 53, 5. Is that on there? Let's go to the next one. What, what, what the scriptures say about us. Here's what the scripture says about us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our what? Iniquities. Wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Well, the prophecies of Jesus in his death are, are, are completely accurate. Here's the reason why Isaiah goes on and explains why he would die this kind of a death. It says he was wounded for my transgressions. He was wounded literally for my sins. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? is death. But I love the second part of that verse. But the gift of God. What is the gift of God? That Jesus came and took our place on the cross. Is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus would be our substitute. He would go to the cross and take our place on the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. The word wounded literally means this. It means to pierce through. Once again, a fulfillment of scripture. They pierced my hands and my feet, he says in Zechariah 12. That's how we know that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Not only was he wounded for my transgressions, it says he was bruised for my iniquities. Literally, he was crushed 
for my guilt. You know, to get a bruise, you have to kind of have, a, I guess, a forceful hit or something like that. I'm on blood thinner, so I bruise real easy. All right? Um, I've had, you know, I've been working one time, whack my leg or someone give me a good punch. Hey, buddy, boom, right there. You got a big old bruise right there. Um, you get a bruise because of that. Some of you don't bruise as easy, maybe, or whatever like that. But being on blood thinners, I bruise easily. And uh, it's kind of interesting. That's the word that's used here when it says that, it says, he was bruised for my iniquities. The iniquities deal with the guilt and the shame. And it's kind of interesting because when Jesus went to the cross, not only did he take our sin, he took our, our, our guilt and our shame as well on the cross. And it's interesting because the very next verse after Isaiah 53, 5, verse, verse 7, or verse 6, he says this, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I, I can lay down my Bible like that, or I can <laughs> lay down my Bible like that. I'm thinking that when Jesus took the sin and the shame and took it upon him, it's interesting. It says the wrath of heaven fell from heaven upon him. I'm not an engineer, but I know velocity is 9.88 meters per second square. It fell from heaven, and when it hit him, it crushed him there on the cross. And it answers the question, why would Jesus die on the cross? He, he did it for you and for me. That's why. You know, it's sad to say, we, we can talk about a message like this. And there'll still be people that'll walk off and, and never give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Scripture lets us know how much God loves us. He loves us more than anything in this world. He gave his only begotten son. And friends, as I said before, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. It's a matter of whether you recognize where you're at in your life. It's not a matter of what you can offer. Peter thought he could offer to God. It's not a matter of what he can offer to Jesus. It's what Jesus did for him that made all the difference in the world. And it's what he can do for you. Maybe you're here today, and I hear people all the time say they're going, to, they're going to clean up their life, and when they clean up their life, they'll come to Jesus. That's the biggest lie ever. Again, think about the thief on the cross. How much did he have to clean up in his life to come to Jesus? He, like the songwriter, said, Nothing in my hand I bring. Just simply to the cross I cling. That's all we have, the cross of Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you know what I say? Look at him. Just look at him. Let's pray together.